Take a look at this photo. I don't think there ever existed an image that perplexed me more than this. From right to left, this old mysterious photograph is a sure contradiction. By all definitions, it shouldn't exist. Naturally, I had to find out more, and what I discovered genuinely shocked me. You're probably wondering, what's so mysterious about this photo? Look closely. On the right, you have one of the most infamous figures in recent Muslim history, Mustafa Kemal the individual responsible for abolishing the caliphate as we know it. Then there's this individual in the center, Ahmed Sharif al-Sanusi, a man who played such a pivotal role in defending Islam and Muslims. He may just be the most important leader we've ever had since the last Khalifa of Islam. The man who mentored and trained the Lion of the Desert, Omar al-Mukhtar. At first I thought Mustafa was holding Sayyid Ahmed prisoner, but then I looked closely and realized that Kamal was glad to be in the same frame as the Arab foreigner. Now, I'm confused even more. Why did Mustafa Kamal, the father of secular Turkish nationalism, want to be seen next to this mysterious religious figure? This story is one of lies, conspiracies, manipulation, shadow deals and deceit. If you stick to the very end, you will find find out how this relationship ended in one of the most treacherous betrayals in Muslim history. But first, let's start from the beginning. Ahmed Sharif Asanusi is born into a world that's on the verge of tearing itself apart. 1873 to be precise. The colonial dissection of Muslim land is in full swing and Asanusi is right in the middle of it, as he is born in Al Jarboub, Libya. Being brought up amongst the family of scholars, it was no surprise that Asanusi memorized the Quran at an early age and subsequently mastered the various forms of recitations. His wise father began working Ahmed from a young age and turned him over to his uncle Al Mahdi to be mentored. Al-Mahdi played a pivotal role in Ahmed's life and sculpted him to be the fearless warrior scholar that he came to be. Young Ahmed wasn't the only one in his family to be trained this way, as his family was a part of the Sunusi movement, a popular Sufi order that was established by his great-grandfather, Muhammad ibn Ali al-Sunusi. The Sunusi order enjoyed great success in capturing the hearts of young men and women by calling for Islamic revival, emphasis on education, self-reliance, and resistance against colonial powers. So they didn't just teach and preach, they took action. The founder, Muhammad al-Sanusi, began the fraternity from Mecca, utilizing the distinguished scholars in the sacred land. Like a battle tactician, he deployed renowned scholars in diverse Muslim communities, such as Burqa, Libya. By cleverly stationing a center of learning in Burqa, the Da'wah can reach influential knowledge-thirsty nomadic tribes that exist in remote geographies. These centers gave rise to a new generation of leaders, scholars, and reformers which brought about the generation of Ahmed Asanusi. And what a leader Asanusi turned out to be. Al Mahdi trained Ahmed and prepared him for leadership by overseeing monumental tasks and assuming colossal responsibility. Like the one time he oversaw and managed the transition of 2,600 people from Al Jarboub through the harsh desert into Kufra. Al Mahdi was pleased to find out that his nephew executed the task with great success. Asanusi in Sudan. Being satisfied with his nephew's competence, Al Mahdi took the young, ambitious Ahmed to the city of Kuru in Sudan. It was there where they called people to Islam daily and impart the teachings of the faith. Being involved in da'wah, somehow, some way, they found extra time to defend the faith and fight the French colonialists in parts of the Sudan. After years of cultivating character through da'wah and jihad, Al Mahdi sent Sayyid Ahmed was ready to become the successor to the tariqa as his time was coming to an end. So in 1902, Ahmed Sharif al sanusi became the grand leader of the Sanusi order. Ahmed returned to Libya and transformed Kufra into the nucleus of the Sanusi movement. He led his followers with a remarkable sense of sincerity. He made sure that he was never the bottleneck to the progress of Muslim victory, always ready to give up control in order to bring benefit to his people. Italy's invasion of Libya. Just before the First World War, in 1911, Italy decided it wanted to imitate its role models in Europe and invade Libya to colonize it. Italy invaded Libya and successfully snatched its capital, Tripoli. Assamosi was rattled by this planned attack on his homeland, so he did what he knew best, resist. 
First, he gathered a council of respected local figures in order to practice the Sunnah of Shura, or mutual consultation. In this assembly, Ahmad Sharif al Sanusi declared with unshakable resolve, By Allah, we will fight them even if I stand alone with just a stick. Sending shivers down the necks and spines of his elders and teachers, he showed his people what it meant to refuse to bow to the occupiers, regardless of their strength or arrogance. The next step to his calculated strategy was to call upon Muslim fighters to join the Jihad as he believed it was a duty for all responsible souls to have a role in defending the faith and homeland. His call was so effective, it was heard way across the dry desert plains of North Africa to Muslims of Afghanistan, Basra, Turkey, India, and even Madagascar. Whether it was financial, military, or moral support, the Muslims showed up when he needed it most, just as he showed up when Sudan needed his aid. After consolidating power, Assanusi along with the Ottomans began his epic battles with the Italians starting from the west. Ahmed sent his brother Safiya Din to lead a battalion into Burka's western regions and back the ally tribes. In a spectacular clash with the Italians, Safiya Din led a decisive blow to the occupiers, leaving them shocked and trembled. He continued to deploy his disciples strategically across various positions to defend, including his crown jewel apprentice, Omar al Mukhtar. Italian garrisons crumbled one after another as they retreated across the arid plains and hills. Mizda and Al Qusbat were liberated and the Mujahideen marched boldly, coming within 15 miles of Tripoli. In Benghazi, the people defended their city with unwavering valor, showcasing remarkable heroism that resonated with Muslims worldwide and became a glorious tale in the annals of time. Ottoman Empire's involvement in the Libyan Jihad. Assanusi's remarkable efforts against Italian colonialism gained him the Sultan's recognition. Ottoman reinforcements, including distinguished officers like Anwar Pasha, Mustafa Kemal, yes, that Mustafa Kemal, and Aziz Ali al Masri, fortified the resistance through modern warfare training. However, this didn't stop the Italians from securing areas like Homs, Misrata, and Tripoli, employing brutal methods to suppress the resistance. But Italy's war fuel was running out it knew that its conquests were limited and ultimately needed to pressure the Ottoman Empire into negotiations. To conceal their failures and weaknesses in the eyes of European community, Italy issued a statement declaring the annexation of Libya in order to make out that the Ottoman military presence in Libya was illegal. The Ottomans naturally objected this bogus annexation, calling it a breach of international law. France, Russia and Britain adopted a policy of non-interference, leaving the Ottoman Empire to handle the situation on its own. They launched a potent campaign targeting the Ottomans' vulnerabilities, aiming for Ottoman withdrawal of support in Libya, even conducting negotiations of peace deals and surrender of territory. On the other hand, Ahmed al sharifs stance on peace was unwavering. He firmly rejected any peace agreement that surrendered their homeland to the enemy. He warned that accepting such a deal will stir strong resentment against the Ottoman Empire among Muslims worldwide. In response, when Enver Pasha proposed peace to Ahmed al sharif his reply was resolute. By Allah, we will not surrender them from our land, not even the span of a horse's back. But this fell onto deaf ears. The Treaty of Lausanne was signed in 1912. What does that mean? Basically, the Ottomans conceded land over to the Italians. Ottoman power was withdrawn from the region, leaving Assanusi alone to defend Libya. This was the first of many acts of distrust to hit Assanusi. Assanusi's government. As a result of this treaty, As-Sanusi took the initiative to fill the void left by the withdrawal of Ottoman forces by introducing the Sanusi government, guided by the motto, Paradise lies beneath the shade of swords. He called on every individual aged 14 to 65 to go to the battlefield, armed and equipped. This stubbornness was a thorn in the side of Italy. This made them even more determined to crush Ahmed al sharifs forces. They aimed to strike the Mujahideen's camps in Sidi Aziz and Sidi al qarba on the banks of Wadi Derna. This led to a momentous battle known as the Battle of Qarba, or Friday's Battle. Through divine assistance, the Mujahideen secured a decisive victory in the battle. Being involved in establishing a new government, it was hard to believe that As-Sanusi participated in several active campaigns and inspection tours of camps in the Green Mountain, all of which contributed to major success. 
The Italians were so desperate to remove As-Samusi from the picture that they sent Abbas Pasha, the ruler of Egypt at the time, to stand down. But Sayyid Ahmed stuck to his typical response, no. He and his people persisted in their struggle. World War One. Sayyid Ahmed was born at an interesting time. You see, I don't think most people born now at the turn of the millennia know exactly how much fitna plagued the ummah back then. You have to understand that Muslims back then lived through iman shaking trials. The theft of mass swaths of land belonging to Islamic waqf endowments, the industrial murder of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Muslims around the world, and the systematic dismantling of the last caliphate as we know it. The point is, the Grand Sanusi knew that the world was changing and he knew that he wasn't going to complete his mission until he knew how to take on developing industrial war machines engaged in world war. A world war that increased the colonial players in Africa, all of whom saw Sanusi as an instrument ready to be used. As a matter of fact, because of his military success, several powers wanted to recruit him as a part of their war effort. Even Britain in Egypt attempted to win a Sanusi's favor by writing to him. On the other hand, the Ottomans allied themselves with the Germans in the war and saw as Sanusi as an asset to their efforts to defeat the Brits in Egypt. The Ottomans and Germans saw the war in a broader context and Libya as a subsidiary part of their strategy. But Sayyid Ahmed was intelligent enough to know that fighting a new front to the east in Egypt with the notorious British was a bad idea. But as Sanusi made the decision to stay loyal to his Sultan in order to preserve Muslim unity. Depending on who you ask and when you ask, this is one decision that doomed the Sanusi movement. Muhammad Assad cemented in his book, The Road to Mecca, that there is no doubt in my mind that he was prompted by a most unselfish motive, the desire to safeguard the unity of the Muslim world. But I have as little doubt that from a political point of view, his decision was the worst he could ever have made. He had to fight in the north against the Italians, in the southwest against the French, and the east against the British. Sometimes I think to myself, what would I have done if I was in that difficult position? Preserve Muslim unity by fighting with the Ottomans and surround yourself with enemies, or break off from a united Muslim front and have a chance at defeating an occupying force. A difficult dilemma indeed. Against his better judgment, as Sanusi launched an attack on the British forces inside Egyptian borders in early November 1915. He defeated them in Saloum and pursued them to the area of Sidi Barani, where he joined forces with Egyptian nationalists led by Mohammed Saleh Harbi. However, the British managed to repel the attack in the Battle of Al Awaqir in 1916. As Sanusi relented as he continued the fight from the southern front by capturing several oases. But the fact remains, As Sanusi fought on horseback with rifles against British artillery and aircraft in open terrain. His forces lacked supplies and his resources were depleting fast. He knew he had to place more focus on jihadi efforts and so he placed religious leadership of the Sanusi order in the hands of Idris as in 1916. Unfortunately, this was not enough to save the sinking ship. as launches an attack with 10,000 Mujahideen on the British in the Egyptian western desert near Saloum but he was defeated. The Saloum campaign ultimately marked the end of Ahmed al-Sharif's struggle against the British in Libya. The British followed the defeat with an invasion of Jarboub, as Sanusi's home city, in 1917. The decimation of Jarboub was a painful loss for as Sanusi, which marked the collapse of his jihadi effort in North Africa. He was being chased out of Libya by the British and the Italians. In 1918, he had no choice but to leave by taking a German submarine out of al aqila he and some of his top leaders were exiled from Libya, except for Amr al-Mukhtar, who withdrew to the Green Mountain. At this point, it was clear that as Sanusi's enemies had won the fight. as Sanusi's arrival in the Ottoman Empire tilted his form of battling. In Libya, Ahmed was fighting on horseback in dry desert plains. However, in the Ottoman Empire, he was arguing with rhetoric and played the song of politics in Sultan palaces. This is the point where as Sanusi's story gets really interesting. He urged the Ottomans to support the Muslims in Libya, finding some success in the Prime Minister Aizat Pasha. He persuaded Aizza to send him secretly back to Tripoli with weapons and supplies to reinforce the fronts. But once again, 
politics got in the way as ceasefire agreements between the Ottomans and Italy thwarted any possibility of such a mission. Another politically motivated deal that killed the hope of liberation. It's hard to believe that Sayyid Ahmed still held out hope for any sense of return to victory, but he did. He moved from Istanbul to Bursa preparing for a return to Libya if the ceasefire effort failed. All that didn't matter because the Ottomans were losing the war. Fast. In fact, in 1918, the Allied forces invaded Istanbul and took control of all the provinces and ports, with the intention of dismantling and dividing the land. It was the destruction of the Turkish Empire, and the Turkish people were about to be eaten up just like the Arabs before them. Amongst all this, an emerging figure was rising from the chaos. A military commander, that goes by the name of Mustafa Kemal. In 1919, Mustafa Kemal had resigned from the Ottoman military and headed a new movement, a nationalist movement. Mustafa Kemal grew close to Ahmed al-Sharif al-Sanusi as he couldn't help but to respect the legendary Mujahid. Kemal needed as much support as he could take in fighting the invading allies, so he correctly thought to incorporate the Sanusi name to recruit religious Turks to fight the invaders. Muhammad Assad eloquently described the profound impact of Sayyid Ahmed spiritual and moral authority in the service of the Turkish cause. Sayyid Ahmed embarked on tireless journeys traversing the towns and villages of Anatolia where he earnestly implored the people to throw their support behind the Ghazi or the defender of the faith Mustafa Kemal. The Grand Sanusi's relentless efforts and the radiance of his name played an immeasurable role in bolstering the Kemalist movement, particularly among the simple peasants of Anatolia. These humble villagers for whom national slogans held little meaning had for countless generations regarded it as an honor to sacrifice their lives for the cause of Islam. After the Greco-Turkish War, the Kemalist forces prepared to enter Istanbul, and following a long siege and negotiations with the Allies, an agreement was reached to evacuate Istanbul from occupying forces. The Kemalist forces entered Istanbul and achieved an almost impossible rebound victory from multiple invaders. And so now you know how this photo came to be. It was a trusting relationship of friendship and unity between Arabs and Turks that resulted in preventing Muslim land from falling into the hands of colonial vultures. The key word in that sentence is trust. And if you've been paying attention to the story so far, then you will most likely know what happens next. Mustafa Kemal's government, after consolidating its position of power, he deposed the Sultan Abdul Majid and removed anyone associated with the Ottoman dynasty. A shocking turn of intentions for the defender of the faith. Colors change and true faces emerge as Kemal gained power. Rather than grounding his social revolution in a rejuvenated and spiritually invigorated Islam, as he promised, the people including Sayyid Ahmed, Kemal chose to forsake the very spiritual force of religion that had initially propelled him to victory. In an attempt to modernize Turkey, he rejected all Islamic symbols and values from Turkish society. That includes changing the letters from Arabic to Latin. In the wake of Kemal's anti-Islamic reforms, Sayyid Ahmed found himself consumed by bitter disappointment and a sense of betrayal. The stark divergence from the spiritual essence of Islam deeply troubled him. He voiced his anger, telling Mustafa Kemal that they along with other Muslims, had supported him only to preserve the integrity of the Islamic religion. Consequently, Sayyid Ahmed made the profound decision to withdraw completely from all political activity in Turkey, saying, I have expected this since Abdel Majid's abdication because my stay in Turkey does not sit well with those who want to manipulate the affairs of Islamic law and blur the aspects of the true religion. I have chosen to leave Turkey and this is the consequence of my support and advocacy for it. Turkey will lose its standing among the Arab people and the Islamic nations. After the Ottoman Empire. Eventually, As-Sanusi traveled to the Levant. However, the French colonialists could not bear the fact that a Mujahid legend stay in their occupied land. Under mounting pressure from the French government to leave the Levant, Ahmed al-Sharif found himself seeking refuge in Hejaz. By 1924, As-Sanusi in his old age had the privilege of calling the two sacred precincts his home, and its people were also privileged to take him in as one of theirs due to his legendary status. Whether it be Mecca or Medina, As-Sanusi's heart was back in Libya, praying for his 
people's victory over the occupier. He did not let his old age stop him from directing efforts towards the eastern region of the country where the indomitable Amr Mukhtar was at the forefront of the struggle. Like the time when the famed Muhammad Assad met the old Sanusi in a brief meeting in Mecca. It was this fleeting union where Assad would say about the old warrior, in the whole of Arabia, there is no man whom I love better than Sayyid Ahmed. For there is no man who has sacrificed himself so wholly and so selflessly for an ideal. Muhammad Assad had a way with words that effectively translated the literary images into my mind with clarity. Listen to his description of the Grand Somosi. Suffering was engraved in the beautiful brow of the aging fighter for faith and freedom. His face with its little grey beard and centrally shrewd mouth between painful grooves was tired. The lids fell heavily over the eyes and made them appear drowsy. The tone of his voice is soft and weighted with sorrow. The eyes assumed a glittering sharpness, the voice grew into resonance, and out of the folds of his white bonus, an arm rose like an eagle's wing. A beautiful description befitting a man hard to describe. The Grand Sanusi gave Muhammad Assad the important but dangerous mission to travel to Libya to meet with Omar al Mukhtar and closely assess the status of his jihad movement. Assad was deeply committed to this noble mission and did not hesitate. The goal of Sayyid Ahmad al Sanusi and Assad was to revive the Zawiyah jihad movement in Libya, focusing on the Kufra region and supplying it with arms and funds from Egypt. However, when Assad arrived in Libya, the town of Kufra had already fallen and the Italian fascists had tightened their grip on the Egyptian-Libyan border. Assad spent two days with Amal Mukhtar discussing ways to salvage the jihad movement by retreating and re-coordinating, but to no avail. It seemed that Al Mukhtar was well aware of the fate of his jihad movement, which was nearing its end. He told his visitor Assad, My son, we are already approaching the end of our journey. We fight because we must, for the sake of our religion and freedom. Whether we drive out the invaders or die ourselves, we have no other choice. To Allah we belong and to him we shall return. Assad could not convince the tired old fighter. How could he? Mukhtar had been fighting for such a long time, there was no energy left for talking, consolidating or further planning. Eight months after this visit, Al Mukhtar fell into captivity and was later martyred at the hands of Italian fascists. The Grand Sanusi accepted his loyal companion's decision and subsequent fate with a graceful acceptance. On that blessed Friday, the 13th of Dhul Qiada, in the year 1351, 10th of March, 1933, he returned to his creator. His earthly journey concluded in al baqiyah a sacred burial ground nestled near the tomb of the esteemed Imam Malik ibn Anas in the holy city of al Madina. In the tapestry of Islamic history, the life of Ahmad al-Sharif al-Samusi emerged as a radiant thread woven with unwavering faith and unyielding commitment. Allah says in the Quran, among the believers are men who have proven true to what they pledged to Allah. Some of them have fulfilled their pledge with their lives, others are waiting their turn. They have never changed their commitment in the least. In the light of this noble Quranic verse from Surat Al Ahzab, we find the profound reflection of the life and legacy of Ahmad Al Sharif Al Sanusi. In his 61 years of life, Ahmad Sharif Al Sanusi fulfilled his pledge to Allah with sincere dedication. He stood steadfastly for justice, freedom, and the defense of the oppressed, even at the risk of his own life. Despite the trials and tribulations that he faced throughout his life, Ahmad remained resolute in his commitments to the values of Islam and the principles of righteousness. May Allah have mercy on his soul.